Welcome to the DCX podcast, where I interview leaders in the customer experience space about how digital is changing the landscape and how you can leverage these changes for success in your business. Today, I'm excited to be speaking with Megan Burns, a renowned customer experience expert, founder of Experience Enterprises, and a former principal analyst at Forrester Research. She's a passionate advocate for customer-centric business strategies, and I'm super excited to have you here. Thanks, Mark. So you've had a long and successful career in the field of of CX, starting from your time at Forrester. Can you share with us a little bit about how you got involved in CX and what drew you here? Sure. My story is a lot like most other people's where I was doing CX before I or anybody else called it that. Uh, I started my career as a software engineer, Um, but I realized in grad school that I cared a lot more about the people who were using the software than the software itself. I was the person that lived between the business, I was at AT AT&T, and the technology team translating, here's what we want people to be able to do. And this was some of the very early functional websites at AT AT&T, and translating that into how do we actually make that happen as a technology. Practically speaking, the best way to describe that job was marriage counselor, because the business and the technology teams did not speak the same language. Mm -hmm. Um, And over my grad school and my early career time, I had the opportunity to work with a lot of user experience folks. And so I got introduced to experience as a concept working with human computer interaction designers and agencies. So when I left AT&T and went to Forrester, we were, this was 2006, most of what we did within the customer experience team was actually user experience. We were kind of beating the drum saying, guys, this is more than just your website. This is all of your channels together. Uh, But virtually no one was thinking that way at the time. That started to change in 2008, 2009 with the Great Recession, which made people go, we can't just throw money at attracting new customers faster than we drive away the old ones. (laughs) Maybe we ought to think about this. And so at that time, our research coverage expanded to include enterprise customer experience and really looking at it as a holistic business concern. And Bruce Temkin and I were the first two analysts who really focused on that. And I've been in that space ever since. And what was the response when you started talking about that holistically at the corporate level? Very often it was crickets. (laughs) Uh, Sometimes it was active resistance. Sometimes it was, I'll be honest, bewilderment. People just didn't, even now, people just don't understand the concept of knitting together, like looking at your business from the way the customer experiences it. But there was a lot of interest and curiosity. I would say that a better customer experience is not an end to itself. It's a means to a business end. So we've always had the most success when we've talked about you want to improve your churn rates. Well, let's look at ways to reduce pain in the experience. You want to have more growth. Great. How can we build the capabilities for you to find those cool things that make people go, I only want to do business with you. And the fact that that's something that's a capability that can be built into the organization that you can consistently do. That's the concept that it takes people a while to get to, but when they do, they're off and running. In the last few years, you started your own firm, Experience Enterprises. And so what was your vision for this company and how has it evolved? Sure. And I'm glad you asked this question because not a lot of people know this, but I chose the word enterprises because the word enterprise means an undertaking that is difficult important, or requires boldness. Mm. And that really resonated with me. I never wanted to be an entrepreneur. I never dreamed of having my own business. But I realized that we had been successful in getting people to care about customer experience, but it was a very different kind of interaction to take them from caring about it to doing something about it. So we had all these executives who want to do this, And it takes more than a strategy day here and there or a speech. It's a much longer, more involved process. So my vision for the company has always been work very closely with a small number of clients over a long period of years. I get to know them. I get to know their executives. And and we work on this journey, which is very often it's political. 
It's dealing with personalities. It's navigating external things. So that's really the core of my advisory practice in the business. I've started doing more speaking again because there are so many people struggling with that other part of everybody's talking about how do I get people to do something about it that I said, you know what, I, I have a lot to share about that. So after not speaking for quite a few years, um, partly because of the pandemic, uh, I'm getting back out on the speaking circuit because I hate to see people suffer. <laughs> well, I, I look forward to more of your speaking. <laughs> you've worked with a lot of different companies and I'm sure you've had some challenges and some successes. You can share about working with different companies and how they took to the idea, because you mentioned politics, you mentioned alignment and activation of these experiences or activations of these programs. Love to hear more about that. And how do you get that alignment? Very slowly and very carefully. I always tell people that you can't make someone do something and you can't make someone change the way they think. And the more actively you try, the more they're going to resist. I'm a huge behavioral science nerd. And it's like Peter Sang, who's the founder of systems thinking said, people don't resist change. They resist being changed. Mm. And it's absolutely true. So a lot of it is engineering the opportunity for people to have their own epiphanies getting data in front of them, finding a way to say something that suddenly makes a light bulb go off. It's bringing people along in little increments. More often than not, when people come, it's usually in a break-fix mindset. So it's a lot of, we have no idea what the current experience looks like because it was never designed or built. So we need to reverse engineer that, find the pain points and fix them. And that's a process at this point, you know, 17 years in, that there's a lot of structure to and a lot of things people can help with where I end up coming in. And, and I did this a couple of years ago for a company. They had that down. They knew they could do more. They wanted to do more. So what's beyond that when your strategy is be less bad, when you want to go from being not bad to being good and being uniquely good in your brand way. What does that look like? And so I've spent a lot of time helping give them a mental structure for what that looks like, what exactly does customer experience impact, Um, but to show them that there was this death by a thousand cuts experience that was happening. And it wasn't necessarily any one thing that was, that's it, but that it was the series of things that was building up to when it came renewal time, they were significantly more open to talking with a competitor because the pain of what they were feeling, though not acute, was cumulative. And seeing somebody realize that and going, oh, there's a cost for all the little things we've decided not to do. And we're paying that cost, whether we realize it or not. Those kinds of epiphanies are don't come often, but when they do, they feel really good. Yeah. In in companies like that, is there a single leader or is it a group? How do they organize to be able to deliver? There's usually a, some sort of a centralized customer experience team. Sometimes there's a couple of them within business units. I've worked with a lot of companies where they had that central group and they were going, okay, now how do we raise this up to the next level? There's usually one leader, smaller team, five to 10 people, if that. And it's a lot of ground game. It's a lot of meetings. It's a lot of conversations. It's a lot of sitting in on other people's meetings. So it's it's truly changed by influence, but it's done by a small group of people who choose where they focus very strategically. It is much better to be a catalyst than a crusader. A catalyst finds something they can change, something small that starts a chain reaction that causes people to have these aha moments or try something different. Do you find that with companies that have been around for a while, people who have been in their positions for a while, that they're more resistant and you have to vandalize the idea of customer centricity and give them the tools to see the other side? Very often, yes. Most of the companies I work with have been around at least 50 years at this point. 
But a lot of it is just the curse of knowledge. You know too much. I always tell people, you know too much to really be able to see yourself through your customer's eyes. Um, You have to find a way to be compassionate and a way also to be respectful and recognize that they have a lot of expertise. They didn't get to where they are by being stupid. They don't know what they don't know. And so a lot of it is giving them an opportunity to see something from a different perspective. More and more, I think there's so many outside forces changing things that even people who've been in a company and in a role for a very long time are recognizing that what they knew about customers or thought they knew about customers may have been true, but you don't have the whole picture And that's sort of psychologically more palatable for a lot of people to accept. One of my favorite things is calling customers and hearing their perspectives on what we thought we were doing right. And they were going, no, this is how that came across. And it's a difficult but rewarding opportunity when you can talk with a customer. So Thinking about that as CX professionals, if I wanted to get into this space, like what, what kind of skills do you think I need to be successful? In terms of skills, I always tell young people, if you don't know what to major in, major in psychology, because everything you do, you'll have to do with people. I think really strong business foundation is not something that a lot of CX folks have had inherently going in. I think not just data analysis, but data presentation. Nobody wants data. They want confidence. They want confidence that the decisions they're making are good. And that's what they look to data for. And so being able to tell a story in the data, first of all, it sticks more with people, but it also gives people much more confidence because they can understand the reality of what the data is describing. So being able to present and tell that story of here's what's going on in our customer base with the data, that is probably the biggest skill. And a lot of times there's there's too much data, not enough insights, and not enough connection of those insights to action. So understanding systems is hugely important, I believe, as well and how things come together and what doing one thing over here has an impact over here, having to think through all the moments in a, in a minute way, and then being able to analyze, are we doing it right? Is it coming across correctly? Yeah. Uh, Systems thinking, I think is absolutely critical to be successful in today's world. It can feel a little bit overwhelming to talk about that, but just being able to trace and understand the connections. So many bad experiences are the result of unintended consequences. So being able to trace through, well, if we do this, then this, then this, then this. Yeah, that's absolutely critical. Yeah. So technology plays a huge part in what we're doing today in customer experience. There's all these different ways that consumers can interact with you. And there's so much disconnect channel to channel. In companies that you've worked with, have you seen that? And how have you brought those silos together? Oh, goodness, yes. I'd actually be surprised if I didn't see it. The way I bring those silos together is actually by focusing on the customer goal. The word journey has been very widely adopted, but the original definition of a customer journey and a journey map was the steps that a customer takes to accomplish a particular goal. So if we focus on the goal, all of those channels are permutations on how they can accomplish that goal. Mm -hmm. One that I love to share is onboarding. No customer wants to be onboarded. They want to be able to figure out how to use what they're buying from you to do the thing that is the reason they bought it from. How do I do my job with your technology? How do I watch the shows that I want to watch, you know, with your platform? And so not talking about onboarding, but talking about the getting started experience, same pieces, just in a very different mental package. Yeah. And where do you see new technologies like AI, machine learning coming in? It's it's the buzzword of the day. Every, yeah. every application, every customer platform, 
everything they're touting is AI driven now and is going to bring more value, bunk or the future? A little bit of both. First of all, we can't forget that there's always a human at the end of that experience, right? So we, people will talk about um, chatbots uh, or virtual assistants as an experience innovation. Like, no, it's not really changing the experience for the customer. The customer thinks they're having a conversation and getting an answer. It's an innovation behind the scenes of how that conversation is being delivered, but the customer doesn't care and may not even know whether they're talking to a real human or a bot. So I think there are big implications from an operational perspective. Obviously, one of the uses for AI and machine learning is prediction. How do we get people to buy more? How do we get people to do what we want them to do? I don't necessarily consider that customer experience. Just because you're getting somebody to buy more doesn't mean that that makes it a better or worse experience, but there are legitimate applications there. So I think there are applications for it. I think like any other technology, we're jumping in and going, wow, this is really cool. You choose it for everything. And we will gradually learn the places where it is and is not actually helpful. But most of the companies I work with are still like, should we do a survey or can we implement analytics? Mm. So it's so far outside the realm of where most companies are. I think journey orchestration is probably the one place where it's really powerful to be able to come in and use technology to help serve up the right things for a person. That I think is a, is a really powerful application of technology. So let's talk a bit about empathy. When we think about the digital experience that today is lacking, where do you see the opportunities to bring more empathy into the digital experience? Well, so this is a great example of where you have to take baby steps. Talking about empathy in a lot of corporate cultures will be the fastest way to get you thrown out the door. It's like empathy schmempathy, especially a, a technology company. So I always start with the concept of perspective taking. I don't care whether you feel what that customer feels, but can you at least understand and see the world from their perspective? I think empathy in terms of injecting more humanity into the digital experience, there are absolutely ways to do that. Some of it is all the way up at the design. For example, this designing for one of these is mm -hmm. very different. So even as a speaker, if I'm doing a virtual keynote, my slides look completely different than even a main stage keynote because I know that they might be able to read three words on a slide for the 40% of people that are watching it on their mobile phone. So mm -hmm. thinking about the context uh, and also the emotional context, this is a framework um, that I use on occasion. Um, people don't come to an experience from a neutral emotional state. So thinking about what is the emotional context that comes from the environment they're in, their home, their work, they're doing whatever that comes from the nature of the task. Are they doing something they want to do or are they doing something they have to do? It comes from the um, perspective on the domain or the industry. So understanding that emotional context, I think the end result is a, a lot of less is more. And I think that's why some of the most successful applications are the ones that are really streamlined. But I think a lot of it is understanding the world in which the human having the experience is living. We just have to remember and think about the fact that these these are people. Back to the operational components of CX and the day-to-day, -day. we talked about politics a little bit, but just how do you help balance the customer needs and the business objectives? How do you manage those conversations when you when those people are trying to make a decision that says, you know what, the right thing to do is this, and the business says, but I can't do that. So you make the best decision that you can. I think there are a couple of things to take into effect. There was one company that I worked with that had a Venn diagram where they had customers, the business and employees, and they would look at where in different decisions, where they had leaned more towards. And the idea was to kind of have a fair allocation. I think another issue though, that is really, um, important that people don't think about is human sustainability, mm. uh, especially with employees. I learned this the hard way. Sometimes your most customer centric people will drive themselves into the ground. So you're not just 
supporting employee work-life balance, you're actually delivering a better customer experience because customers don't like working with grumpy zombies. I would say that having a good customer experience program does not preclude you from doing things your customers don't like. It just means that when you do them, you do them with a full knowledge and acceptance of the consequences. L.L. Bean changed their return policy from lifetime returns to, I think it's like 10 years or something a couple of years ago. And there was a big brouhaha over that. But they were like, yeah, but you know what? We're willing to accept that because there's enough fraud in the system. And we're hearing a lot about that in retail now. Sometimes you just have to pull back and find a better equilibrium. How do you find the right balance? How do you know the right balance of kindness and honesty? It's not a good and a bad. And that wisdom to evaluate the situation and find the right point is something that you can only develop over time from being in situations. And so that's one of the things when companies talk about using judgment, it's building that practical wisdom to say, when is the right time and place to lean one way versus the other? Right. What's your definition of a great customer experience? My definition of a great customer experience is one that helps the customer get things done in a way that makes them see the company as helpful and as a useful entity in their world and in their lives. That's interesting. And companies I work with talk about building relationships mm-hmm. with customers. And for the most part, I don't think customers necessarily want a relationship with you. They just want your promise. Whatever it is that you said you were going to do, that you deliver on that. And that if it doesn't work, that you're there to help support, get it back in the right place so that they can continue living their lives. What is that relationship idea to drive more loyalty, to drive more retention, lifetime value? What's your take on that? I agree completely. And there are emotional attachments to brands and emotional relationships with brands. The way I describe to people, I tell people to aim for an experience that is consistently good and strategically amazing. Consistently good is really hard in a big business, but that's that certainty. You're going to deliver on your promise. You're there. I can count on you. Strategically amazing is either... When something does go wrong, if something does go wrong, I know you've got my back, Uh, but also looking for places and opportunities and ways to do something special, whether it's a little thing that just adds a smile to somebody's day, or it's a big, important moment of truth. I love that. One last question for you. What advice would you give to professionals who are starting their journey in customer experience? (sighs) Small victories. Know that be that just because you're saying things and it's not immediately making a difference or aren't immediately happening, it doesn't mean things aren't happening. I sometimes talk about it, you know, people think it's like an intellectual discussion. Customer experience does this, we do this, we do this. It's not a discussion, it's a dance. Mm-hmm. And you're working with people over time and you're kind of leading them and guiding them. So as hard as it is not to get discouraged, and that's one of the great things about this community recognize that things are changing, even if it's not visible right away. And the seed is growing underground and then it sprouts and you just don't see it until yeah. it's time. So yeah, awesome. Well, really wonderful to speak with you, Megan. I, I appreciate uh, you taking the time out of your busy day and uh, sharing some of your experience and, and wisdom with us. Thank you.